Welcome to the Fight Podcast with Jake and Nikki Hamilton, where we discuss the complexities of marriage and manhood through real, raw, personal stories. Welcome to the Fight Podcast with Jake and Nikki Hamilton. Today, we are going to talk about ministry. Dun, dun, dun. Something we're all too familiar about. So we are going to jump right in. All right. Well, let's get started here. All right. Where are we starting? We want to start back before we got into ministry, how we got into ministry. I think that's really important to know because I don't think either of us, we didn't have like ministry in our generational lines where we were like just, you know, following this thing that was in our family for the most part. Um, When did your family get saved, Jake? Well, I think that my parents, we're not going back that far. Um, (laughs) We're uh, actually right after I graduated. So this is like the short version. Right after I graduated, bought a $50 guitar, went and worked at a camp for inner city kids, Salvation Army. Um, Like within two weeks, I'm the worship leader of this camp come home, volunteer for the youth group. That youth group then has like at a Baptist church at a Baptist church in our city. And, um, literally around the corner from the house I grew up in, my parents were there, uh, since we were, I was in junior high and, um, volunteered there. One of the leaders then started a college group and the college group turned into a full on church that we were doing like services, like hyper creative, emergent church services on Sunday nights. So that is where you and I met. Enter Nikki. Well, yeah. And and again, like I kind of tripped into this thing. It wasn't like, man, I can't wait to be in ministry. Like it, I didn't even know genuinely, I guess this is actually a real, a real thought now that we're having this conversation. There was never a point in my life where I was like, you know what I'm going to do and make money doing for a living is loving Jesus is work for the church and then like do ministry stuff. So just, I want to make sure I don't know if that's just showing our age. Cause I, maybe back it was either our own ignorance or that wasn't a thing. I don't know. I mean, we couldn't, I mean, I don't know if it was or not. I mean, genuinely, I mean, I think what we make like $500 a month and are like $800 a month in our first year of marriage or something. I mean, it was like very, it was, it was very, very long time ago, but I'm going like, I guess just expressing it now, thinking back on the story, it wasn't like for context of what we're talking about, this wasn't a lifelong dream. I was going to go work for Disney. Actually. I really wanted to be an artist. There was like all this stuff I wanted to do, you know, but we ended up, it would have been more profitable to do those things. It might have. I, yeah, I probably, yeah, that's a whole other conversation, (laughs) but then (laughs) so we plant this thing on accident. We have Sunday night services at the Baptist church that are super creative and enter me. Yeah. I, uh, hadn't really been a church attender in high school or anything like that. I think by the time we got out of elementary school or I got out of elementary school and I could stay home alone, it was like, yeah, you don't really need to come to church. And so I didn't. And I went out and partied with my friends and kind of saw a very ugly being close to LA spent a lot of time seeing the ugliest versions of LA. Mm. And the very short of it is in a small span of time, I was in some of the seediest, darkest places you could be in that environment in Hollywood. And I was like, oh, I this world could be like, I could do this like this. Mm-hmm. This could be where I end up. And if I don't change things now, I will end up here. Very shortly after that, my cousin and his then girlfriend, now wife, said, hey, there's this um, college group at the church. Do you want to go? I still don't. I think I said only reason I said yes is because I kind of had that experience of like, oh, I don't want to I don't want to live in this world. You know, I need to change something. So I say yes. And I walk into that church that night. You're on stage playing your, your little guitar. And I kind of never looked back. I remember thinking, I cannot believe that people are this innocent and good. 
<laughs> because there was a lot of church yeah. kids there. Yeah. And it just blew my mind. Like this is a side. I just, I wasn't in that world. You know, I was raised by a single mom and most of my friends came from very broken, dysfunctional homes. And we sort of ran the streets. That was the world I was familiar with. So walking into church the first time blew my mind that people like this existed. I didn't know that was, a, I had no concept, no grid that there was a world where people were, I don't even know, just so pure and good and loved Jesus. It felt like a, I was stepping into like high school musical or something. And I loved it. It didn't feel cheesy to me. It felt like refreshing coming from the place I was at. So anyways, we did that. And that was right before kind of tr the church, the college group transitioned well, yeah, into a, being a church. Yeah, it was a emergent church. There was this whole model. Some of you might remember old enough to remember that there was like these church within a church models. So it mm -hmm. was like at two churches existing, we had our own sort of identity in the midst of another mm -hmm. church. And then, um, eventually the church was just like, Hey, we want you to plant. We really want you to, to go for it and be your own thing. And honestly, like looking back, we can say this, like now that church was ridiculously amazing. And how often do you hear stories of like, we want you to take 500 of our people yeah. and all of the offerings and just go for it. For six months, that church gave us the offerings we were taking in order to launch well. Like the amount of like blessing CB and care. I mean, we took it for granted. Oh, yeah. Like, CBC. Community, Community Baptist, Baptist Church, Church in Rancho in Cucamonga. Cucamonga. Like all high fives to you. <laughs> yeah, they like all of them. You yeah, know, Rob really. Acker, the whole crew at that time. They just really blessed us. Like yeah. we, they didn't even have to. Anyway, that's a whole other side yeah. story. But I'm like, again, it's the goodness of when the thing is just pure and there's no intent or motivation that's selfish. It's like you can just bless things. And God, that's such. I want to honor that. To a degree, I still haven't in all of my life. You know, I just haven't seen that a lot. So, um, but then we planted a church. So we have this church. We go from what a group of 60 people to a church of like 500 almost overnight. It was what it feels like over six or eight months at that point. And now we have a church and we're 20 years old and in almost engaged. Well, so we and start, they hire me at this on staff to be like the administrative assistant that's church lord for secretary I, think. <laughs> uh, it, I didn't matter i was so thrilled to be there yeah. uh, honestly and so you and i start working together and it didn't take very long that we were like oh we're gonna get married i think within a year we were married so we started our marriage off with me as your secretary and doing a lot of life together because of that, you know, staff meetings and retreats and working together, everything was done together and we're married. So now we're living together and that would feel like we're so connected and right. we're spending so much time together. But in reality, we were still just kind of doing work together well, yeah, and, and not I, marriage together. And I remember that. I actually, now that we're saying this, I remember back there, back then we would have these fights and you're like, we don't spend time together. We're <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, we literally spent the entire day together. I don't know what you're talking. And it wasn't because I was trying to not spend more time with you. I genuinely did not know that that wasn't connect. I had no grid for the fact that time at work together was different than like actual intentional time, which I understand now, just so we're clear, but oh, you know, yeah, yeah, you do. yeah. <laughs> more than I do. I think <laughs> now look how the tables have turned. Uh, uh, yeah. So I kind of felt like a ball that you were, you were juggling in some degree and at the same time. So here's the other thing. So I have very little church experience. Suddenly yep. I'm not only on, not only do I have little church experience. Here's my funny story. Uh, <laughs> this is a good story. I, what, this is how naive I was or whatever you want to say, whatever you want to call at the time. So I'm also the secretary administrative assistant for the youth group leader for the youth yep. pastor. And we're just starting this youth group. So he's like, hey, call some other churches and set up some meetings with their youth pastors so we can kind of, 
you know, feed off them and get connected. So cool. I'm going to do it. So I call the first church, which their youth group was called 316. And I'm like, oh, hey, talk to the pastor, right? Hey, you know, can we set up a meeting with you? And yeah, your name's so cool. Like, what, what's that all about? What's 316? He's like, you know, John 316. I was like, okay, cool. What's John 316? I had no idea that that's... <laughs> <laughs> Every Christian knows what John 316 was. The guy was so thrown off. I was like, he was acted like such a jerk to me that I didn't know what it was. I hang up the phone. I go to the, the youth pastor. I'm like, guy, that guy's a jerk. He like acted like I should know every verse in the Bible. I didn't know what John 316 was. And of course the youth pastor's like, wait, what? You don't know John 316? <laughs> like you're on staff at a church. But I didn't, you know, I learned it then that day. Which in all honesty, look again, that was like super fun because it's like, it, there wasn't like this, like performance driven ministry thing. It was just a bunch of really sort of newbies who radically wanted to change. We really believed we were going to change the world with what we were doing. Yeah, we were, you know what I mean? we were young and innocent, innocent and naive. No. So my point is that I, I didn't know what I was doing. And now I, not only am I on staff at a church, I'm also married to the pastor. And I don't know, what does it even mean to be a pastor's wife? So at that time we had Long's Christian bookstore. Mm. Yes. Was that like a chain? Does and, it... No, Family Christian Bookstore is a chain. Long's okay. was local. It was our local yeah. one. Probably went to Family too. That was the one yeah. in Evelyn. Yeah. yeah. I think I went to both of them. Let me, this is also when you had to actually show up at a store yeah. to find out if they had things. There was no looking this up on the internet. Yeah. That's Amazon. how God, old, old we are. Sorry, everybody. So I went in, in search. I'm like, okay, I'm going to buy the book on how to be a pastor's wife or the book from a pastor's wife that just sort of talks about how you do this. And it did not exist. Nope. I still don't think it exists. I still want to write that book. Yep. But I, I did not, I felt very much out of, out of my, out of the water, like a fish duck, out of water. Fish out of water. <laughs> yeah. I was very lost and confused. So I'm like lost and confused on how to be the pastor's wife and lost and confused on how to really connect with you. And we talked yeah. about this in our first podcast, but yeah. there was a lot going on there. Yeah. And also trying to find, um, I think what I got when I first went to church is I didn't have this language then, but it was the law. There was the rules. Right. All of a sudden you have like a box that you're put into. Yeah. And for me, that was great. I, I, I've heard, I hear a lot of people talk like how the rules and the religion, that's just this horrible thing that's like put on people to oppress them. And, and I do understand that. I, I understand where that's, that language is coming from. However, when you have no grid for the law, for you should not have sex before you're married. Uh, there are certain ways that you should live and speak and have character. I just didn't know those things. So they were in one way. So I'm trying to disseminate like, oh, these things are awesome. Okay, so this is how you live a righteous lifestyle. And at the same time, having to develop a relationship with God that's free non-judgmental and right. all loving. So that is like what I'm process. I'm still processing that. I'll be well, honest. Rohr talks about it all the time. I love what Richard Rohr says about it. He talks about the fact that if we don't understand the law, we'll never fully be grateful for freedom. And there's so many people who are trying to jump past any sort of boundaries, any sort of, uh, commitment, any sort of, um, real character development, mm -hmm. the suffering, the sacrifice, the pain, even that we talked about in the, the last podcast where there's like that stuff actually sets you up to embrace freedom starts feeling like a breath of fresh air and you can taste it when you're in it because you know what it's like to actually live in some sort of structure. Mm -hmm. So it, you have a foundation to come back to. It's not like one or the other. It's both and so this thing led me to freedom. I can actually fully embrace and fully enjoy because I'm, 
I actually know I've actually built the character and the fortitude to stand in freedom without compromising my character because I know what that actually looks like in my life. Yeah. So although I look back at that season and I think I learned a lot of things that are actually unnecessary and unbeneficial for my real day in day out existence and my authentic relationship with God. I also look at it and think I needed that in that season of my life. I, I went through a whole season where I burned the Harry Potter books. Mm. Well, actually that was later. I'm jumping ahead a little bit. That was more like once we get into charismania, (laughs) I burn the Harry Potter books. They're back in my house now. I read them to my children now. Not, uh, you, you know. read them to our teenagers? I, well, That's no, awkward. I did Weird. when they got a little older. And I, I do watch the movies. But I I did that. It, in that season, it was like, I'm not going to wear any makeup. So I went through yeah. this whole, you know, coming out of the club scene and was like, I need that. I'm going to I'm going to not wear any makeup. And I went through this whole season of not wearing any makeup and. And that's this very religious thing to do, right? It's like, oh, I you can't wear makeup. And and of course now I wear makeup and I don't look back at that and think it was childish or stupid. I look back on that and I think, no, in that season, I needed to rend myself of the world. Yeah. And it's it wasn't religious for me in that right. season, or maybe by definition it was, but it wasn't like I had this posture of of religion religion religious behavior. Yeah. I needed hemming in in that season. I needed to fast makeup and fast the things that I had spent a lot of time giving importance to in my youth. Absolutely. And so I just say that because I hear a lot of people, I, I often talk to people who um, can be some how it feels like this condemnation or like, Oh, you're a lesser than Christian. If you're in the season where you're having to do, or you're doing things that feel religious and I've been there and I don't regret it. Makeup came back. Harry Potter came back things. You have to, you have to know the season that you're in, right? Like where, where am I at? What, it, what do I need? Anyways, so. Well, and I think in our marriage, like what I would say is that's twofold because that really actually laid foundation for us that for us to stand on later. The Some of the, the foundations we even learned or gained or got there in our relationship with the Lord and even the dysfunctional stuff in our relationship, the actual community that we were a part of gave us a view and gave us some boundaries to be able to actually do relationship in safety. Because there were so many things, like you said, that weren't like allowed or like mm-hmm. there just was such strict boundaries and I held to such strict boundaries and we held to such strict boundaries because we were leading a church that we like we couldn't there was just things you didn't touch or didn't go near or didn't go around there's no drinking there's none of these things because you're leading this thing and so i think it gave us even a lot of the foundational it gave us a season that was really difficult it gave us boundaries to actually exist in that even though we were in sort of dysfunction Mm -hmm. there was boundaries and hemming in that caught that told us to fight for this thing regardless of how hard it is right and i would also add that i which i hadn't thought about either is I, that was one of the most consistent meetings I've ever had was 5 a.m. up at Heritage Park with the five men who were leading this church. Like the leaders got together every single week, like rain or shine. Like it was consistent for what is that? Like four years, five years. I wasn't invited, so I don't remember. Yeah, you would not have been invited. You were a girl. It's a man's only club. But it was like, That is, and it was like every week was like, really what's going on in your life? You know what I mean? Like that was not, it wasn't like a, yeah, I hope you're doing well. It was like, what are the struggles? We found out about everyone's new babies at that meeting. We found about everybody's struggles in that meeting, every single person's brokenness in that space. Everything was just laid on the table for that meeting to be like, here it is. Five guys, I think five, six guys at the max 
the leaders of this church every single week were doing this. It was not a Bible study. It was not a, okay, well, we're going to do this devotional. It was just raw connection and accountability and uh, vulnerability in a way that I had never experienced until that meeting, which I think is still impacting what I'm doing today, even with the fight and things like that. Like that was the first meeting I'd ever been a part of like that. What? Cause I've heard, I've never been a part of an accountability group. I'll be honest about yeah. that. Um, it's just <clears throat> never been offered to me, I guess, but I've heard a lot of people talk negatively about accountability groups because it's like a place to come dump off your junk. Yep. And then you feel like, Oh, I've been abdicated from my sin and I can right. walk off free. Right. So what is the difference between what you're talking about? That was really impactful to you in a positive way and the other. Well, I think that, um, accountability without authenticity and vulnerability is performance. So if I'm in an accountability group where I'm just like, and again, I think I've shared this before and you've heard me say this, but I had this great counselor one time who was like, I'm like, yeah, here's what I'm struggling with. This is what's happening. You know, this is what's going on in my life. And it was, I think it was the dude who was, who was the my counselor at that time. And he said, he said, do you, I'm just going to stop you right there. Do you know the difference between being vulnerable and telling on yourself? I, that is, very hard to know the difference if you're someone who like not likes but who does tell on I I tell my myself all the time right and he said and he this is what he said this is how he defined it and it stuck with me for all this time and I think that's what I experienced in this group is I got to learn the difference in this group that I was meeting with for all these years and the difference he said was you aren't being vulnerable until you don't control what happens next what does that mean? What it means is if I'm controlling the narrative, I go, I'm going to tell you enough so that you know that I'm being like, I'm giving you information so that you want to be connected to me and feel like I'm being honest, but I'm not going to give you so much that I have to pay a cost for it. So I'm going to tell you like in this group, it was very much like the, they're like, here's everything. I'm giving you all the information and it possibly could get me fired from my job. Like these are all people who work full time at the church or whatever we considered full time at that time. It was their only income or their right. only job. If I tell you this, that was what was coming every, almost every week. It's like, here's what's happening in my marriage. Here's what's happening from porn, masturbation, uh, marriage stuff. All of it was being laid on the table so that everyone could look at it and ask questions about it. It wasn't, see, most accountability that I've experienced is like, hey, I'm struggling with this. I've looked at porn and everyone's like, oh man, I'm so sorry for you. Okay, well, we just, let's pray for you. It's like, well, no, no, I'm going to ask you 20 questions about this. Where is it showing up? Why did it show up? How did it show up? When did it show up? What were you feeling? What were you experiencing? So that you don't get away with it scot-free by just going, here's the information. I'm just going to tell on myself. Everybody's going to be like, oh, dude, that's so awesome. Thank you for sharing. It's like, no, 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 that's great. Now let's deal with how you got there. And we didn't have any tools back then, but I know now that we do have tools, I know that the foundation of knowing the value of that was in that group. And that was where the difference between just accountability and deep vulnerability from men really showed up for the first time. So from that place, you and I get married, we um, develop a great system of working together. <laughs> no, it wasn't a great system, Nikki. It didn't work at all. I was a workaholic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that we developed whatever that system was that we were going <laughs> a to survival sur system, survival mechanism <laughs> during that time. Uh, once I had our first daughter who our last podcast talked about Geneva and um, her diagnosis of cerebral palsy. So I have her and we, I stopped working yep. at the church and become a full-time stay at home mom. And every two years pop out another baby. And so we have to, so now I, I really become just the pastor's wife and you become the pastor guy who's taking meetings, um, late at night. Well, and, and it transitioned. Remember that even, so we have Geneva, 
Mm-hmm. We have the diagnosis, which we talked about in the last podcast, but that diagnosis leads us from sort of Baptist evangelical root system to our like charismatic. I show up in Reading, I show up at Kansas City, and the transition begins to take place where we're moving from this sort of you know, version of what we've known to be church into what we're doing. And we plant a house of prayer. So even by the time we have second, third babies, right. We are already moving forward in house of prayer now, not just Sunday church services. Yeah. Our whole world got really turned upside down. I I still look back at that season with such trauma of having kids and, you know, transitioning to a new church. And now, you are, I mean, you're, you've kind of always struggled with being a workaholic and, um, me feeling Mm -hmm. like I was really on the outside of the glory cloud. Yep. And in some ways I feel like I've processed it. And in other ways, I, I feel like I haven't. And I think we touched on this on the last podcast, but, uh, talking about Geneva, but it's Mm -hmm. when we transition. So there was no glory hype thing at the non-denominational church. I mean, it was great to be there on a Sunday and whatever, but you weren't worried if you missed like a a service that you might've missed an angel showing up and people seeing gold dust. (laughs) I mean, this is true story. I'm, I'm not saying whether or not the angel really showed up and there really was gold dust. I don't know, but people were saying there was. And so that became all of a sudden it's like, you're really on the outside of the glory and the move of God because you're sitting at home with kids. For me, Hmm. that was kind of my journey with that. And so I went from this, okay, God, here's the religion, here's the rules, and I'm following them. And and I like this, the safety a little bit of being in boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I'm exploring my relationship with God with, within those boundaries and trying to figure out what does it mean to be a pastor's wife and what does it mean to honor God in, in a marriage. I remember reading, I just remember this, you know, the book I did find was a, I think her name's Beth Moore. It's been, you know, mm-hmm. almost 20 years now. Yep. And part of the ways that she, t- this wasn't just for pastor's wives. This is just like how to be a good wife is like you organize your husband's closet. So I remember like organizing your closet. I don't think you ever noticed because why would you care if your closet was organized? But I was really making an effort to be a good good Christian wife. Was that when it was co- color coordinated? Yeah. I was trying to be a really good Christian wife in those ways, you know? Yeah. But anyways, we move forward. We get into this, this charima- charismania. And man, that for me was so hard to do jump into because on one hand you're like being introduced to the holy spirit and that's so cool and beautiful and there's all this magic happening everywhere but for me on the other hand i was the one with the kids in the back room that felt really insignificant which really confirmed the fact to me that yeah i am not god's favorite and that's like a lingo you learn in that world is yeah. like God's favorite. I don't know yeah. if that's still a thing. I don't know. But when we were in it, it was like, oh, you're God's favorite. And everyone's God fa- God's favorite. But it no. was still a thing. I felt like, oh, I hope I no one realizes that I am like not God's favorite because none of the glory clouds are coming my way. <laughs> well, and how much of that is like, I guess, how much of that is the way that we were connected and my lack of ability to reach across the chasm of pain that we already were in to be able to pull you to the side so that we were together, regardless of how many hours and all those things that it cost the, the Valley in between the chasm in between, I wasn't as a husband reaching across that in the, in a season that is the most difficult for mothers. You know what I mean? Like the very, difficult plowing season of young children in the home and then add on daughter with cerebral palsy and new job. And I think even as a part of that time, we were living in your aunt's house, you know what I mean? There was a lot happening in that space, you know, and I 
take responsibility for a lot of that because it really was my job to do that. And I had no tools to be able to do that. Like in our, in that's, what's so crazy is, is in ministry land or church land, as we call it, it's the priority is the meetings. The priority is the ministry. The priority is, well, you got to pay a cost to be a part of, I mean, how many times did I get told, you know, it was just a cost to being a part of the ministry. And I get that, but I don't think people were equating that, your family isn't supposed to be that cost. That's not the cost. Your family isn't supposed to be the cost. Yes, there is a cost and there is a cost to your life and um, what that looks like, but it's not supposed to be your family. Your family is not the cost. And it was really solidified when we took that jump from, you know, the, the church to the prayer house to the charismatic whatever. Because all of a sudden, in in the non-denominational church we were in, there wasn't this like itinerant Christian celebrity thing at all. It just didn't exist. Oh. You're like your little church, nobody from the well, outside. Well, there was a couple. I mean, there would be an Irwin McManus or, uh, you know, a Rick Warren or guess, a Bill Hybels, you know. I, at I that never, <laughs> and me, well, I never saw them as, any, right. I mean, whatever. They ran huge mega things they meant that nothing were like in my world. supposed to be cool. Yeah. I was not trying to get a prayer not from anymore, or a prophetic word or, you know, right. I did not need them to sprinkle stardust on me. But when we moved, made this transition, all of a sudden, it's like this world of Christian celebrities. And oh, my God, if you could get a prophetic word or if you could get them to pray for you or touch your yeah. shoulder, you were going to yep. somehow be can uh catapulted that's not the right word catapulted, catapulted yeah, it's the word into the third heavens or something yeah, um that's real. and so there was that going on and this feeling inside of me go and all of those people at least the impression i got from them is their calling was the same as their relationship with God, like it's, it's the same, like God first and their calling were one mm -hmm. and you had a calling. And I always knew that. I always knew that you, when I married you, Oh, I'm marrying someone special. Like you, you had, and, and I think anybody who's ever known you would say, yeah, there's just something special about him. Like he, there's something special. So I knew when I married you, I was making certain sacrifices, right? Like I know that, that this is going to be a, a big journey that I'm entering into with you. But then you go to the charismatic church and all of a sudden there's this language of calling put on it. And so the weight that I am supposed to bear m magnifies and I really can't do anything anything to step in the way of your calling because essentially doing that would be stepping in the way of you and god yep and that sucks because i love jesus i don't want to be the reason that you don't fulfill your calling that's like a huge burden to carry yep. so if the difference is you going off to one of these glory dust conferences or being at home just to like help me make breakfast for the kids. Clearly I, my like making breakfast and having a moment at home with the kids is not as important as you changing the world basically by going to this conference saying it sounds so stupid, but that's really, oh. that's really how it feels when you're, when you're in it. I totally agree. I think that there's a huge, there is a huge system that is promoting this, I mean, if I'm going to slow down and not be in a podcast for a minute and actually like think through this, because there's been so many conversations about this as we're, we're, we're promoting marketing and sort of implementing this, this really weird hyper Christianity celebrity thing where everyone thinks they need to, in order to serve God, well, they need to be in a third world country. They need to be running a ministry or they need to be an itinerant or anything in the, in between there, like to have a normal, a, a, a really beautiful 
normal life with a nine to five and kids and a steady income feels like it's almost looked down upon. Like to have like, oh, it's like, oh, you settled. Oh, uh, yeah. You didn't. You decided to put away your calling. Yeah. And, and it's so, yeah. and that's what I, I guess that's what I'm trying to communicate, which I probably don't have great language for is I'm trying to go like, man, we've so we've, we've made it so hyper. It, and the hard part is I, I've participated in this. So let me, let me be very, very, very clear. I want to take responsibility for the part I've played in this. So I don't want to like go, and I've never done that. So, you know, it's all of everybody else is no, I've played a massive part of like the hype of it. And using you mean the, the height of Christian. I, what I'm saying is the hype, the hype, theologically, dogma, the, theology, dogma, ideology, whatever we want to call it, whatever that language is that's right that I don't have, that sets up people for failure because they believe they're never doing enough for God, even when they're because the even when they're radically love when they're radically when they are loving him daily with simple rhythms in their life that build healthy marriages and lasting foundations for their children and grandchildren like there's no value for that like mm -hmm. it to, and we may say we value it but we don't put those testimonies on the platform no. like how many how many charismatic or just even normal church meetings have you been in where Hey, we're going to, Hey, Joe's going to come up and give a testimony today. Joe, give us your testimony. Hey man, just want to say thank you guys. Bless God. I worked 60 hours last week and at this job and I just, I worked really hard, provided for my family, love my wife. We're in love together. We do date night every single Thursday. My kids, we engage with them in this way and this way. We actually, I try to date my children on a regular, like completely unsexy. They didn't, there's no where. And then I preached to the guy at work or like I read reached out to this, or I did this thing at the Starbucks. It's like, no, I really loved my family. My kids are doing really well and they know how valuable they are to me. Mm. No, you don't hear that. That's the testimony this Sunday. Thanks for, you know what, Joe, thanks for living a beautiful, normal life in God and serving him. Even when you, it's showing up on Sunday, even when you had to work 60 hours this week to provide for your middle-class family, I'm lower middle-class family. I am so grateful for you, Joe. We celebrate you. Yeah. No, it's like, <laughs> that, that doesn't mean crap. No wonder people are like feeling like they, they can't do family well because there's no celebration of it. There's no normal celebration for the guy or the wife who is the wife who is at home giving of herself daily to love her children and the wife who's and the husband who's sacrificially working in a job that gives him no glory is probably is, it may be not even get him any promotion, but he's doing it because he loves his wife and his kids. No, we don't see that at all. And I think it's why there's a mass exodus from the church in a lot of ways because if you don't i was in the... well can we even can we even call it it's not even a uh it's like a shadow exodus what do you mean because i i do i was thinking about this i would call it a shadow exodus because all the people like you and i would talk about in our friendship circles people we know it's like they they don't go to church but they're church people like yeah, us, there's a lot you of know that. what I'm saying? I'm <laughs> saying it's a shadow exodus because it's like, well, where do you go? Well, I go to this church. Well, do, how often do you go? Do you see what I'm saying? I guess it's like, it's. Yeah. We, but then you also have the people who are leaving, pounding their feet, oh yeah, fists in the air. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm, but I think that to me is like, if we knew the, ex I guess I want to mention like this shadow exodus. Yeah, you're right. Because at the end of the day, if we counted the shadow exodus with the people pounding their fists, we would be massively surprised how many people are not just not attending church, but not engaging with that system at all. Unless they get to serve for a weekend on the worship team. Mm -hmm. True. Or they get an opportunity to meet with somebody who's cool. That's true. And that is the only time they're showing up, but it looks and has the appearance that they're still there, but it's completely, it's, it's a, they're not there. They're disenfranchised. 
Well, they're totally disenfranchised, totally disengaged with the whole process and they're out. Yeah. But they don't want to say that because then they feel like less of a Christian. So it's just, that's why I'm calling it a shadow exit. I think that's know? great. Honestly, that was me for many years. Yeah. Maybe I maybe still actually. I, I don't know. I um Yeah, and 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 exactly why you said I was standing behind you with this huge calling and you kind of got catapulted for a season into the heart of Charismania with music mm-hmm. and all the traveling and you were on the road constantly. And I'm at home with three kids, one with disabilities. And I was not experiencing the things that you were experiencing. Yeah. So I would go into, Oh geez, I would go into the green rooms. That's where I spent most of my time. Cause that's where my kids would be. And everyone wanted to come up. They all, they were in good with a good heart wanted to come up to me and be like, so what's your passion? Like, I know you have like a desire, like what are the desire? Cause they're watching me just dying back there with three crying kids, trying to keep them quiet while you're out doing whatever you're doing. And we've been on the road for how long, you know? So their intention was to try to, I don't know, engage with me and tell me I was important, I think. And it was just universal. So what's your dream? Like, what are your desires? Oh my God. i I wanted to scream like, do you, on what planet do you think I have space to make this about me right now? Like, I love that you're single probably and, or you don't have kids and you can just make your whole little Christian life about you. I have a husband who's running 500 miles an hour ahead of me, chasing glory clouds a kid with a disability and then two other little ki- babies that I'm trying to wrangle. And this story is not about my, what I'm passionate about or what I desire right now. And I would, you know, in my kindest way, try to say that. And it always fell on this. Oh, you just don't have identity in Christ. You know? Yeah. Man, I'm like, I guess I'm thinking like, guy, we were, it's, I, it, would you say that it's the same thing? Like with Geneva, we talked about this last time. Would you say that it's similar to going, Hey, instead of reaching out, praying for trying to get a notch on your belt, can you just see her as a human and just engage with where she is, not where you wish she was. And to be seen and heard is more valuable than to give me some word about like how you should be dreaming something else. Cause I guess, I guess the way I'm, oh, this is what I think. Yeah. I think it's the, de- the, it's the destruction of the family. No. Family only functions if you have people sacrificing for it. Absolutely. And in that moment I was sacrificing for family. You were too, you were sacri- you were the provider and you were financially providing for us and you were working and that was a sacrifice. I think you got way more applause for doing your sacrifice than I did. No one wants to applaud the stay at home mom who's not trying to at the same time with their other hand pursue some ministry or some career or something that seems really glitzy and glammy. I, I didn't, there was no way when you have a child with special needs like I did and traveling constantly trying to keep our marriage together and two other kids. There's, there was no space for that, or at least I didn't have capacity for it at the time. So I really had to put my feet in the ground and say, I am going to make, I'm going to be a mom. I'm going to make sure my kids eat healthy. I'm going to make sure that they get a, to bed on time. So I may tell you how many hotel rooms I sat in at seven 30 in the bathroom. Cause we didn't have cell phones even back then, you know, with a magazine while my kids were asleep in the other room and you were out at the glory conference because I wanted them to have a normal life and motherhood and family require sacrifice. And I only say that because everyone is telling you to go out and chase your dream. Mm. And you know what? Maybe you don't get to chase your dream. Maybe you get to sacrifice and grow deep and develop some deep roots into the soil of humanity and earth, which is painful and it hurts and it doesn't always work out. But hopefully the fruit of it is, the fruit of it is that the people around you get to, 
a little more water on their soil because of your sacrifice. Yeah. Where's that message? You know, like where is that message? Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I even default while you're even sharing. I mean, my, my gut from this training and the worldview we live in is I'm like, yeah, but what if you didn't, if you didn't have those things, what would you do? Which is like the most Cause I'm, I, and I'm recognizing myself processing it. Cause that was my brain, how it just processed it. And I was like, oh my God, that's it. Because really what we're saying is don't accept the life you have really don't accept what God gave you. Don't grow where you're planted, like uproot yourself, like do go do anything else. As long as it makes you happy and makes you feel fulfilled. And like, what's crazy about this culture in this, in the church and celebrity Christianity is we would never tell, this is the hard part is we, you know, the big oh, 30,000 foot view is we would never tell a teenager if it feels good, do it. But in all the cultures we're around, it's, if it feels good, it must be God. Well, now we tell teenagers that too. Yeah. We tell them that too, but you get, but that, but it birthed in the church. That was yeah. the church's idea first is if, if, if it feels good, it must be God. And we used, there's no way you would have told a teenager 20 years ago, if it feels good, do it. Like do whatever makes you feel good. But yet that's the message we've seen come out of the church. 100%. And now we're watching it repeated by destroying families and letting kids believe they could do or be anything they want, which is narratively not only not true, naturally not only not true, and spiritually not true. You were meant to be something specific. You have a unique design to bring to this planet. Amen. Those things are true. And when well, we no, have kids not, and family, then that is what we're doing. Right. I, I it like I feel my face getting red because I've had to fight this so hard. Because I've been so many people want to come and tell you, oh, but do what makes you happy. Like, oh, you need a break. Like you should. What is it? You don't, it's one thing to get a break, you know, when your husband's working nine to five, maybe, I don't know. And you don't have a child with special needs who needs like your actual care. You know, I don't really get to get many breaks from my child situation. That doesn't mean that I have to have a miserable life. It doesn't mean that I have a right to be depressed. It doesn't mean that I have a right to have a pity party. This is the life that was bestowed upon me. And it is my joy. It is my joy to sacrifice for my family. It's not my suffering. It's not suffering is involved, but it's not the cross I bear. No, I, you have, we have to change our, our thinking on this in the church. It is, if I'm not doing the quote unquote, living the dream, the ministry dream and living the calling that, that all the, you know, people around me are doing, it doesn't mean that I've done something wrong. It doesn't mean that I'm not stepping up to the plate to fulfill my calling. It means that sacrifice is beautiful and it should be honored. And it's not right. Let me tell you as someone who walked around, I'm not trying to say I was some saint at all. However, there was a part of me that was like over my dead body. Will I not be here for my husband and my kids? It was way easier to show up for them than it was for you just because I, you were easy to be pretty mad at, no. but, um, <laughs> but well, the intention was there. Absolutely. I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it. Despite the fact that everyone's telling me you have a dream to live, you know, don't live your, you don't go searching your dream out. Well, yeah. And I think the hard part is we can't look out at the rest of the world. Like we keep blaming the rest of the world and politics and government and all these things for what we're experiencing in culture. Yet at the end of the day, we're the ones who set those things up. We, we have no value for normal family, everyday life, traditional roles, mom, dad, husband, wife, kids that are valued. They are not the center of the home. The marriage is the center of the home. And the the mom and the dad turn their hearts towards God and allow him to lead them properly as they serve one another and serve their children for generational inheritance that has nothing to do with money and they'll never see it lived out. Like when we as the body who actually really love God start to make that the thing we're celebrating over the last testimony or the last outreach, 
we, when we start to value that and demonstrate that value from platform on until we do that, it will not change in culture because we do not value that. We yeah. don't value, we, we want, we expect something from men and women that they absolutely cannot give. And we keep demanding them to double down on things that are absolutely irrelevant to the longevity of their marriage and their family. And then wonder why the thing falls apart and cracks. No wonder so many, this is, and no wonder so many ministers, high profile ministers. Oh, guess what? It was all a sham. Didn't know. Couldn't see that coming. Well, yeah. So this is what, this is what really happens. So if you listen to our first per- podcast or kind of even know us at all, you know, we kind of had a melt, a marriage meltdown. Shocking, right? Marriage Giving- meltdown 2010. Given given this story, things didn't work out, and I ended up with a lot of bitterness because of exactly what we're talking about. Yep. We have a marriage meltdown. And then, as we said, we're overexposers, so anything that's going on in our life, we have to tell everybody about it. So we're still um, traveling, and well, you're, I'm traveling with you, and we're in all these green rooms, and of course, what? how are you doing? We can't just say fine. We have to be like, well, oh my gosh. We, we practically <laughs> just got divorced. <laughs> we are like it was awful and uh, so we're telling everybody this i was story. traveling too much i'm a workaholic i've been in ministry for 15 years all the stuff right so we're telling this in all the green rooms yep. and all the people the itinerants and the pastors of the church and all these things quietly are pulling us aside and yep. going um so I am in that exact position. Like my wife, I think she's going to leave me or I, uh, you know, we're about ready to get a divorce. I kid you not. Every green room we went into yeah, for those all those especially. pastors who are sitting up there giving you those messages on Sunday. have got a whole other story going on when they get home. Not maybe your pastor's great. I'm whatever, but I'm, I like, <laughs> it to might be, be a little exaggerated. I like to exaggerate. Yeah. <laughs> I have met some good ones, but we do know some really no, okay, great ones. This is what I'll say. Just because you're the pastor, you have a pastor, itinerant, any special title on you, they are not somehow immune from normal marriage, normal life. They've got problems. Right. And usually their problems are worse because they're hidden. And I 100% get it. There is very little space for the leader, the pastor, the itinerant to mess up or to not be doing well because you're going to them for answers. And we do as the general population of churchgoers have to understand we have put them in that position. Right. We cannot let them fail. And we know if they do fail, we will eat them alive. Well, and we, you got to remember just from a very biblical standpoint, God knocks down idols. Like he, that's, you will have no other God before me. You don't get idols. You don't get images. Cause the whole idea of, of idols is you're an image of God made in the natural, right? That's what an idol is. And I, and God says, you won't have any of those. So the moment people start lifting up a person or a group or a thing, and it becomes idolized, God has to lower it. He has to. But it doesn't matter even how good it is because he can't let somebody else take any of his glory in that way. It's unbiblical from the beginning of scripture till the end. And I think when we start doing that, as like you said, the general population of the church start going, oh, they're untouchable. Oh, they're perfect. Oh, they're so this. No, what we can do as normal people in the church, here's what you can do. It's very, very practical. Just see them as a very normal person who's trying to do their best before God with what they've been given. And yeah. anyone, any pastor who tells you something different, I say this all the time, so I don't feel weird recording it. <laughs> anytime someone gets up and tells you any different, that they have it together, they have it figured out, or they know everything, or they know exactly what this verse is saying, or any version of those things, you just stand up, wave goodbye and go find somewhere else to go You're because empty every church because right? at the end of the day it's that is not the goal yeah i mean we need leaders who hold their crap together but we need real leaders who do the work and value doing the work of family over doing the work of ministry because they are not the same thing and if you decided to get married and i'll i'll say it this way too is with with P- the difference between peter 
and Paul. We know that biblically, Paul went on a bunch of journeys. We also know that Paul wasn't married. He says, I wish you could all be like me. And then if you look at the journeys of Peter, he never left more than 70 miles only a couple times during his entire life after Jesus. Why? Because he had a family. And so he didn't do the same things. You have to choose. You do not get permission to do all of this ignoring your family in the name of God, call it ministry and feel like you get a write off from heaven because you have a calling on your life. No, when you got married, you said there's parts of what I've been called to do that I am going to lay aside. That is our sacrifice. It is stunningly beautiful because if God gives me these things and I go, thank you God for this. I, and now he gives me this beautiful family and I lay this down. I'm doing it as a sacrificial act for the sake of my family and a generation I'll never see. Does this mean you're not going to go any more than 70 miles? God, I wish that would be the case because we, <laughs> we're still trying to because figure for us, we're we, trying to figure because that the out. Real point for us. It, well, first of all, there's planes and stuff now, just in case you're wondering, they used to walk in camels and horses. But the thing that I would say is, is us figuring out the rhythms in our life that work because we actually have an open dialogue. Mm-hmm. Before there was no open dialogue. Well, okay, it was twofold, I think. Yes, no open dialogue. Part of that was my fault. I did not even feel, I felt like if I ever stood in the way of you and ministry, I was legitimately standing in the way of you and God. And I pictured in my head, I would stand before the throne when I died and God would be like, so remember all those times? Yep. That you thought you were more important than me. Me is ministry, right? So, wow, mm, that sucks. And I'd have to like carry that with me for eternity. And I was not going to do that. So switch in my head. I now realize that that's not true. That ha- yep. that, ha- that had to be kind of ripped out of me. Right. And so we need to say every single wife who's at home with a husband who's working too much, calling it ministry and connecting it to their relationship with God has absolute right to walk up to that man and say, you're putting in too many hours for too many other people that aren't your own family. We need to reevaluate our schedule and figure out what this looks like so that there's clear boundaries for the safety and sanctity of our family. Yeah. And it may go both ways. I think there's maybe women who are doing the same thing, but a hundred percent. I did not know I could do that for years. I didn't know I could do that. So we do that now. I have no trouble at all <laughs> telling, which is so funny. I'm the same human being, but I, uh, something inside of me has awakened to realize that, oh yeah, I can say those things. How much of that was something awakening inside of you? And the, and after our marriage stuff in 2010, my heart was turned towards you. Yeah, like that's it true. was way, the moment that that's like true. the bridge that happens in a marriage is not just like, Hey babe, I'm here for you. My when your lives are turned towards each other and it becomes reciprocal in that way, you know, you're okay. Now you can say things you're not, you weren't allowed to say, you didn't give yourself permission to say before because it would be received Mm -hmm. and it would be a dialogue instead of just a monologue or a demand. Yes. And I want to preface that with, I'm, sounding like I would come to you and say, uh, no, no you're not, not doing that. You would never I would do never that. do no, that. No, it's a you, discussion. It's a discussion. And we both deserve dignity and honor to, in the way we communicate with each other. I yeah. don't get to just come to you and tell you with my snap fingers, what you are going to do. Yeah. I mean, right here on my desk, you know I mean? There's like basically us going, Hey, here's the schedule. Here's what's coming up. Here's what invitations, here's what life looks like, what works, what doesn't, what do you have coming up? What do the kids have coming up? And it's this constant rents, uh, wrestling and tension and sacrifice on both sides to do it. And well. the priority has shifted from ministry slash God to family first. So I think both of us are always looking at the calendar going, well, what works best for the family? And everything blooms out of that because the center of the family is where God dwells, not God dwelling over here. And then families want to like the bubbles around God. Yep. Right. Yep. So that's, that's good. And I was going to go somewhere else with that, that I forgot. Um, Oh, I know what I was going to say. I think, I don't know if you'll feel comfortable sharing this, but, um, you also during this time had a 
pastor guy come and talk to you and tell you that he wanted to be able to do that. Oh yeah. I preached. Yeah. I mean, it was very, very simple. It's a very simple story. And it was, I, some high profile leader and I, we were, you know, late night meeting, got back to the hotel. It's now one in the morning in another country. I've got a knock at my door. So I think I'm getting abducted. It's like taken, you know, I'm going to be taken and Nikki doesn't have a certain set of skills to come rescue me. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I'm lost forever. Don't call me when you need to be rescued. (laughs) Um, And so I was like, okay, uh, I'm looking out the door. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's this person. And they kind of barge into my room and go, I love what you said. Everything you said, I totally agree with it. I totally agree with what you're saying, but I can't do that because if I do that, 500 people around the world will die because they won't have support and resource um, that we give them every single month. And my response was very, very simple. I was like, well, it sounds like you trust yourself more than you trust God because you love them more than God does. And to me, I'm like, that's what we're trying to say. We are utterly convinced that, well, I mean, again, it's twofold, right? Like we have mother and father wounds. So we're still trying to prove to our parents we're good enough. And God, as father, we're trying to say, am I doing enough? Am I good? Tell me I'm good. And when we have nobody on earth going, you're an amazing mom. And it looks like it's hell. Just want to let you know, I see you and I love you. Can I give you any help? Like, Hey, looks like you're trying to run all over the planet. Jake, you're doing a whole heck of a lot for God. How's your family doing? Like I only had a handful of those conversations over 20 years in ministry. How many people do you think over the 20 years asked you, how's your family doing? I would say, okay, we got to split it into two parts. Cause when we were part of the church, um, that we, that we planted, we were having, I was having those regular meetings on a regular, on a regular basis with men. Totally makes sense. There was a lot of that happening. Right. Um, we didn't have any tools. So it was like, wow, that really sucks. Right. Can I ask you five questions? Well, we were also right. early twenties. Like and yeah. like nobody had any tools. It was like, right. uh, we all suck at marriage and we really suck at family. Don't know what we're doing. And by the way, we're playing at church. Um, and so what what ha- I think when I was running around like a crazy person, the only I can one hundred percent say that Chris Valentin was consistent in reaching out in those, those years when we were first, when we went through our marriage stuff, even prior to that, that's how I knew we could call him and set up a meeting at this, at the Jesus culture thing that we were a part of. So absolutely knew we could do that. And then he followed up for years. In fact, we got on a phone call, got in an argument one time and, um, he stopped the phone call. I was like, Hey, I just want to let you know, this is where most people break relationship with me because we're not going to agree on this, but I will be absolutely for you and your family for the rest of your lives. If you want me to be, Hmm. we don't have to agree. And I'm like, and he's kind of, I mean, really to some degree, it's like, I could probably, we could hit him up. You know what I mean? Like, Hey, Chris, but uh, he's been really beautiful in that way. Um, I would say Heidi did that for a long time for us. She was very much going like dude, Heidi Baker from Iris. She was very much like, dude, do not mess this up. Like, do not mess your family up. Like they were very open about their own pitfalls, about their own struggles and how they would have done things differently. And she reached out on a consistent basis for years. Um, Outside of that, I would say maybe a few men who, who would go, Hey, how's your family doing? You know, that were pastors that we went to their church. You know, I would Mm -hmm. say uh, even like I, yeah. Uh, even a couple of people I could mention, but it would be another conversation. So I don't want to bring it up, but like, there's a couple of people that were like, are you okay? Cause this, you don't, you're doing a lot. This doesn't look okay. Mm-hmm. Well, can I, can I help you? Mm-hmm. And it was like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> you know, I think at first, especially when I'm like running full board and everybody's applauding you, you're like, Oh my God, you see me mm-hmm. like, and No husband in ministry wants to be a crappy husband or a crappy dad, you know? Yeah. And that, that's maybe where we'll, we could end it is I do, I would say this, it did take me stepping away from church for a long time to get perspective on church. Yeah. And the perspective that I got was twofold. One because we've also been on staff at churches, we've planted ministries, we've done all the things, I've been behind the curtain. Uh, one is church is a business. 
And I, I know that's like heartbreaking for people no. to hear. Yeah, is it really them. is heartbreaking for you to hear <laughs> that you're the church that you sit your bottom down at a chair on Sunday is not a family, even though they say that there is a family is the same way you're a family when you work at Target together. That's a family. They're together a lot. Yeah. I mean, really, there's a family aspect to it. Target. Just like the church, I say this, I'm, I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm really no, saying this going. to going. say, gr- to give grace to the church. Absolutely. Is they actually need your money to keep their lights on, to pay their staff. The pastor standing on your pulpit, more, cha- you know, unless you have some major author or something, they actually need that money to feed their kids yeah. <laughs> and to pay their mortgage. This is a business. There's a board making sure that yep. they're getting money. Yep. And so they are going to, at some degree, your what's going on in your little personal life and your, your family comes second to them getting your tithe dollars. The same way at Target... They're a business. They are trying to sell products that you will buy because their CEO has a mortgage. So I hate to say that to you, but it's true. Right. I guess I would what I would say in terms of even adding to that, and you could tell me if you disagree. The point is, is that they're trying to the the product that they're selling isn't if they're doing church well, in my opinion, as a as a business, that because it is a business, I 100 percent agree with that. And it's not devastating. It's just honest and it's great. And I think people can totally get down on that. And would it's be less hurt less, if they walked in right. and realized this isn't personal. No, no, no. And here's the point is they're funding programs that help people walk with God in ways they couldn't without those resources. That is essentially what the church and and I I think worship falls under that when it's not celebrity and all the other, th- all the other stuff that's happening with it, when that's with, you know, outreaches and small groups and youth groups and kids ministries and all of the buildings and all that stuff is to create a resource for people to have space to process and walk through their relationship with God, with other people who are doing the same. That is a business. It is an organization with a board and a structure, and it needs all of those things to run in a healthy way with accountability in all of the areas it needs it to be the fullest resource it can be. That is why it's valuable and it has value. We're not saying it's a business, therefore it doesn't have value. We're saying it's a business and it plays a specific role to give it a higher degree of value than what it is in terms of your relationship or walk with God is where it starts to fall apart, where disappointment settles in, delusionment sets in, and we start to get really angry and frustrated at something just because it's not being honest with what it actually is. Yeah. And so I, I think of course, when I took my break, there was a bit of bitterness over the fact that I thought this was a family and I wasn't treated like a daughter, whatever. No, I agree. And with some perspective, I am able now to look back and go, no, actually they, they really need to pay their bills. And they they did offer me a lot. Yeah. I, I am so grateful for every step of my journey within those church walls Heck yeah. because it offered me something that I couldn't have gotten anywhere else. If the church hadn't existed, CBC, which is actually like where we started our college group out at yeah. 19, hadn't existed, where would I have gone as a broken little club kid? I needed that. Right. And there was a seat there's so in every season, the church has served a purpose to me. It's just when we put it in the wrong category, then we feel like we have been super hurt by a system that was never meant to fulfill those roles in my life. Yeah. I mean, it's literally the moment God is ministry and family is church. The whole thing falls apart. The whole thing falls apart. God and family are a totally separate category than, than ministry and church. And it's not when people, if you hear that and you're like, I feel offended by that. It's because you still really need something that the church is providing. And I would say I'd question if you're dependent on it, like as in a crutch or you actually see it for the value it has. Cause we, we love the church for what it provides. We love love and celebrate the people that come 
out of it, the lives that are transformed, the families that actually get impacted and all of the stuff, the nuance and a million things in between. But we got to separate God and family in one category and church and ministry in another because they live on different planets. They're not the same thing. And people get really, really extremely wounded. I mean, I just sat down with an entire church team in another state and they're like, Hey, so we keep using this. We just believe we're a family and this is a family language. And And I'm like, Hey man, listen, I'm just gonna be super straight with you. Do whatever you want. If you could just stop using the word family to describe what you're doing, then people might actually go home and do what you're asking them to do. Mm. Because if I'm convinced that this thing over here is my family, I don't ever have to do the actual work in my real family at home because I'm doing the work here. And that's where it starts to get really dysfunctional. And we'll end with this. There's a, there's so much we could just go on for days, but I want to end with this thought. And it, it really is sort of the, you know, Jake's biblical two cents at the end, which is that you doing family. When, when I say doing family, Loving your wife and sacrificing for your home and for your kids is loving God. And I know that that's true because we know from the Lord's prayer, what we call the Lord's prayer, our father who is in heaven. So first we get dad who is in heaven. Holy is your name. Your, then we get to the part that, you know, charismania loves your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here's the hard part. There's all the stuff that we're calling kingdom isn't actually happening up there because what's happening up there is a dad sitting next to a son who is a husband coming for a bride. That is called a family. The model from the very beginning in the garden and all the way to the end was a family. So when I'm doing family, well, I am demonstrating to the world who I love. Like that is kingdom on earth a family that actually knows how to function well and sacrifices for one another for great grandkids they'll never get to meet.